Yeah, right. On the premises. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 17. We're looking today at verses five, uh, 10 through 12. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. We'll start reading in verse 5, where we find uh, a riot taking place in Thessalonica. Rather interesting. God gave us a letter to the Thessalonians, but where the word of God was accepted, he did not give us a letter to the Bereans. Have you ever thought about that? Where there was trouble, we got two epistles. Where there was no trouble, as we'll see tonight, we don't have a letter that was written to the Bereans. I think there's a reason for that. I think it's a very important reason, and we'll see that, the Lord willing, a little bit later. But tonight we're looking, we'll begin reading at verse 5, and then uh, we'll be looking a little bit later at verses 10 through 12. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. In other words, this was going to be sort of like the incident that Paul is going to experience later on in the city of Jerusalem, where somebody sees him in the temple, runs around, gathers a crowd, they're all yelling and screaming, nobody really knows what's going on, but they say, there's a bad guy over here, we've got to get him out of the temple, they slam the temple door shut, and they proceed to beat him, and finally Paul gets rescued by the Romans. Well, that was what was going on here a little bit. They set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and brought and thought to bring him out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And then down to verse 10. When the brethren immediately, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men, not a few. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we pray for your blessing upon the Word of God as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Father, we thank you once again that you have given to us the Scriptures. Make us like the Bereans. Make us those who search the Scriptures daily, whether these things are true. Help us to be men and women of the book men and women who are interested in eternal things, not merely the temporal trivia and cotton candy froth that is all around us that we are so eager like little kids to, to dig into instead of digging into the meat and the milk of the Word of God. Make us faithful men and women, those who do not want to give up eternal rewards for temporal trivia. Father, we pray for your blessings upon the Word as it goes forth tonight, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now you recall that there were three groups of people uh, that respond in Thessalonica, but as we get to Berea, we find only one kind of a group of people, and they are all responsive. Rather interesting to see the different contrasts as you move from city to city, and you learn that people are not always the same every place you go. You certainly can find that out simply by visiting churches, as I do as I go across the country whenever I'm traveling. Uh, visiting many churches, you find some churches that are incredibly open and friendly. Some churches that really seem eager to hear what the pastor is saying. Other churches, like a church I visited in Virginia several years ago on a, on a vacation driving down toward the south, and we stopped in, uh, and I guess it was quite a few years ago because uh, we had a bunch of little kids with us, and I don't have a bunch of little kids to drag around now. But this church still sticks out in my mind. <clears throat> we pulled in on a Sunday morning. We had a, a van load full of kids. We were towing, uh, I think, a travel trailer at that point. And um, so we pulled in, and we had made sure that all of our kids had gotten neatly dressed up and clean. We didn't look like vagabonds. We came into this church, and it was packed. 
huge church. And um, so an usher escorted us to one of the back rows because everything up front was filled in, <laughs> unlike here where everything in the back is filled in and up front it's all sort of empty. <laughs> and so he thought, man, this must be a really good church. And the preacher got up and delivered a very formal, doctrinally sound sermon. And right along the lines of what this church and this Presbyterian, this denomination would go along with, very doctrinally sound, and after the church service, we of course took a few minutes to get all the kids together, and um, we got up, and as we were making our way out, we sort of paused and hesitated and looked at people and smiled. Not one person in that entire church stopped to greet us. Not one. We hung around for a few minutes, walked a little toward the front, walked a little bit back, just to see not one person greeted us. And so we walked out the door where the pastor was standing there to shake hands and um, it was as though he was looking through an, a block of ice shaking one after another J just like a machine. You know if, if the next person hadn't immediately stepped into the gap his hand would have gone <laughs> just like that. <laughs> like, grab the hand, pull them through. Grab the hand, pull them through. Grab the hand, pull them through. Couldn't believe it. We stood around outside for a few minutes. Groups of people had gathered to, to speak a little bit one with another. We tried to be friendly. Nobody said anything, so I packed everybody back in the van and we headed off toward wherever the evening service was going to be that night. You know, I can't remember the evening service, but I sure remember that morning service. And that was years ago rather interesting. You find different kinds of people in different places and we see that tonight as we look at the Bereans. And of course we have a rule here in this church that you're supposed to turn off your cell phones <laughs> when you come in. <laughs> quite alright. Not quite as formal tonight as we are in the morning. But anyway, so um, we saw that uh, the chief woman back in Acts 13 were moved to oppose Paul but the unbelieving Jewish men were the ones who opposed him, not the women, but the men. And we, we see a different group of women in Acts 13 as compared to the women which were here in Acts 17. And then we're going to see something about the women a little bit later on as we get to Berea. It's interesting that Paul mentions the women in each of these different cities where he goes. Because as you move from city to city, the women are influencers. You know, uh, I remember years ago uh, speaking to a lady and we were we were discussing the issue of the husband being the head of the house and um, she was actually married to a military man actually quite high up in the military as a matter of fact he was a, a man who uh, had been in Vietnam and was quite high up on the staff of one of the major generals Major Westmoreland uh, in that conflict and um, she made the comment well he may be the head of the house, but I'm the neck that turns the head. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> they're all kinds, aren't they? And we see them in groups, as Paul mentions them, doing different things and responding in different ways as he moves through his missionary journeys. It's not an accident that this is put in. It's designed as a teaching lesson so that we might understand how we are supposed to respond and how we are not supposed to respond. We saw that our job is not to be successful, our job is to be obedient, that it's God who sovereignly opens and closes hearts. And that's a clear lesson that we learned uh, when we're studying the responses, not merely of Lydia in the preceding portion of text, but also when we studied Moses and Aaron. We'll talk about that more later next Sunday morning uh, when we get farther on into our text. We learned that we cannot blame God for our sins. We are accountable, even though God is absolutely sovereign. Uh, we find the motive for the riot stated in verse 5, the Jews which believed not were moved with envy. And that brought us back to a brief overview of what we had studied when we looked at the false motive of envy. Many people are motivated by envy. It's listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, along with adultery and fornication and idolatry and witchcraft. And it's listed with murders and drunkenness and revelings because envying is right smack dab in the middle of that list 
and God is not pleased with it. But that was the motivation which drove the Apostle Paul and Silas out of that ministry. And we looked at many different things that deal with envy. We'll not go over those again. But it is found in the church. Paul says so in Philippians 1.15. He mentions it to Titus in Titus chapter 3, verse 3. He met, James mentions it in James chapter 4, verse 5. It's a problem that often rears its ugly head in the church. And so that brings us to our lesson for tonight. Noble in the eyes of God. That little phrase, in the eyes of God, is very important. The world has a different idea of many different things. I've recently been talking to um, some folks, uh, a young couple that is uh, contemplating marriage, and nobody that you would be familiar with here in this church. Um, but uh, talking to this young couple about what are God's standards for marriage? What's marriage in the eyes of the law versus marriage in the eyes of God. What are God's standards for marriage? Uh, what are God's expectations for marriage? What does God expect of a husband in marriage? What does God expect of a wife in marriage? And as we have discussed this, it's very evident that these young people, they're not really that young anymore, but these young people uh, have been infected, both of them are Christians, but they have been infected with the world's concept of what marriage is all about. Dealing with another young couple having incredible difficulties in their marriage right now. I mean, it's mind-boggling even to consider what they're having to face at this point. One of the two in that couple has a very biblical concept of marriage. The other one is absolutely, biblical ideas of marriage, absolutely foreign to the other person in that marriage. It was very sad because the issue on each subject that our lives are affected by has to be what is the bottom line in the eyes of God? Not what is the bottom line in terms of my emotions. Not what is the bottom line in terms of cultural norms. What is the bottom line in terms of the standards that society around me holds, which fluctuate up and down. And as you know, marriage for most people now in many different states uh, is legally defined as uh, the union of two people. Doesn't matter whether it's man, man, or woman, woman, or man and woman. And someday it may be even worse than that. It is already in several of the... Um, Sweden and Norway and other places like that where animals are also included in the mix. It's very sad. What is it in the eyes of God? And so tonight as we talk about noble in the eyes of God, keep that in mind because this is a very important principle that we will learn some things about that can be applied to any kind of situation that you're facing with. You want to know what God says about money versus what the world says about money. You know, you can listen to, to Mr. Bernanke or any of those people, the big gurus and money people. Uh, I was reading today uh, uh, an article that was on um, the Internet uh, where um, Bill Gates is now pushing for a cashless society and pushing it very hard. And he has some very, uh, very interesting ideas, and they're actually trying it out in Manchester, England, where an entire street is going to be mandated by law not to be able to use any cash because they want to see the reactions of the businesses and the people who who do business there at that particular on that particular location they're thinking of expanding it in England they're already trying it in several other places in Europe it will come here to the United States do you understand folks that is pushing toward what we find in the book of Revelation where you can either buy or sell except you have the mark of the beast where they're beginning to laugh themselves off the gold standard, where they're beginning to use, you know, the kind of currency which you keep on your cell phone. And so you buy and sell on the basis of what you've got in your cell phone. Folks, the question is, in the eyes of God, what does this mean? It doesn't matter whether we're talking economics, it doesn't matter whether we're talking morals. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about what we see tonight, the difference between groups of people. Which group of people is noble in the eyes of God? 
So we get back to our text here. I think there are several immediate observations that we need to make. Verse 10 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, as a result of doing that, therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few, a lot of people trusted Christ because of the principles that we find set forth in verse 11. But let's look at the immediate observations. Number one, just remember there's been a riot that took place. We read that just a few moments ago. We find a murderous group of thugs looking for Paul because they're going to beat him up and kill him. But here in verse 10 we find that the entire church is involved in protecting Paul and Silas. Not just Jason and the other who had been living at his house that got picked up when that mob showed up there and then dragged them to the, to the city fathers. And this is only after three weeks. I mean, Paul had not been there for a couple of years and developed some real close friendships with different people who had worked out an escape route for him and all this kind of stuff. It says the brethren, the entire church, was involved in protecting Paul and Silas. In the three weeks that Paul had been there, God had already formed a cohesive group with singleness of mind singleness of purpose and singleness of action three weeks folks now how many of you remember the first three weeks that I was here anybody you know for sure what happened in the first three weeks that I was here anybody <laughs> what's that good for you December 1st 2007 <laughs> That's right. Good. Very good. Some people remember. First three weeks. Now a question for you. Would you have been willing to respond if I had been here for only three weeks and a mob had descended upon this church or upon the manse looking for me to beat me up and kill me? Would you have responded the way in which these people and remember, they're brand new Christians. They had not been a cohesive group before this. It was a group of people who had just come to faith in Christ. And look how they responded in taking care of Paul and Silas. You know, I, I was thinking that over and I thought, well, could have been because there's a group of mature believers here. There's a group of folks who have known the Lord Jesus Christ for a long time. They might have actually gotten their act together and done something. And I sure hope so. <laughs> If I were in that situation, but you see, these people here at, Berea, at Thessalonica already considered themselves responsible for their first and most controversial, as you have had, their first and most controversial pastor. Do we have that kind of cohesiveness even today? Do we have that kind of cohesiveness that if a murderous mob came looking for the pastor or the elders, oh, we got two elders sitting back here tonight. What if they came looking for Keith or came looking for Rick? Murderous mob out there. What if they came looking for them? Would the entire church band together to offer protection and assistance? Would the church hide the pastor until they could get him safely out of town or the elders until they could get him safely out of town? Would the church be willing to risk the wrath of government officials or local gangs who were trying to track the pastor or the elders down? Or would most of us sort of sit back and say, boy, that's dangerous. I, you know, I don't know if I want to get involved. A number of years ago when I was in high school, I don't remember her last name, but her first name was Kitty. In New York, a young woman was stabbed to death on the streets. She screamed for help. There were over 30 eyewitnesses to it. She lay on the street screaming and bleeding because she continued to scream her assailants came back and stabbed her some more it took 30 minutes for her to die not one person called the police although it was later discovered as they did investigations and interviewed people that there had been over 30 people that saw her getting stabbed to death and nobody called the police and the uniform response among all of them was I really didn't want to get involved. Do you remember that incident? Some of you who are older remember that. 
I really didn't want to get involved. Do we here have that mentality of I really don't want to get involved? You know, it affects the outreach of the church. If we only want to do what our teeny little thing is and don't really want to get involved in reaching other people out there for Christ, we don't really want to get involved because it might get messy, it might get dirty, it might get dangerous, it might interfere with our fun. There's a lesson here. The entire church got involved and as a result, Paul and Silas got away. The second lesson I think we can learn by looking at these few verses here is they used the cover of night to help Paul and Silas escape. I think there's a good lesson in that. It is not wrong when the situation requires to do everything, now listen to the next words carefully, morally permissible to evade the enemy. It is not wrong when the situation requires to do everything that is morally permissible to evade the enemy. Paul didn't say, well, you know, I really like to be a martyr for Jesus. I would really like to get beat up. Would you guys not, you know, get in the way? Let me go out and stand broad daylight and say, hey guys, here I am. Take a shot at me. Sometimes the Apostle Paul got caught. Sometimes Paul got beaten up. Sometimes Paul got thrown into jail. But you know, he didn't go looking for it. When it happened, well, that's the way it is. Take it like a man, take it like a Christian. But when he had opportunity, he got away. He mentions elsewhere that when he was at Damascus, the king of the Damascenes was looking for him, and the brothers did what? They let him down over a wall at night in a basket. You know? It is our responsibility to proclaim the gospel, but it is not our responsibility to act stupid. The Apostle Paul had continued ministry. He knew that he was going to have continued ministry. And what the brothers did was morally permissible. And they got the Apostle Paul away. The third thing that I think we learn here, as we look at this text, is the brethren had a specific plan in mind. They didn't just send Paul and Silas away. They sent them, it says, to Berea. Now, they could have sent them a lot of different directions. There are a lot of little towns in that area. They could have sent them in many different directions. They didn't. It says specifically they sent them to Berea. They sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. They had a plan in mind. They sent them there, and perhaps, and this is just supposition, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect, I suspect that some new convert in that church at Thessalonica knew the character of the people in the synagogue at Berea, because that's where Paul went. He knew the character of the people in the synagogue at Berea. Perhaps he even had a relative there. Perhaps they had done business with that group of people. Perhaps the two synagogues did <laughs> youth rallies together. <laughs> like our church and some of the other Bible Presbyterian churches. Did you know, you probably have picked up on this, I've picked up on it, that when I have had interaction with folks from some of the other Bible Presbyterian churches, yeah, they hold the same theology we do. But you know it's a different mix of people, isn't it? Each church has its own particular character. And there are certain things about the character of each one of those churches that is good, and there are some things that are kind of wobbly. Same true here. Some things here that are very good, and some things that are kind of wobbly. But each church has its own distinctive character, a specific group of people that God has joined together in that location. Berea had a specific character character and that is where they got sent perhaps the chief rulers of the two synagogues got together for a rabbi's lunch once a month we don't know the specific connection but the text does indicate that this was the specific choice of the church to send Paul and Silas to Berea fourth thing that I think we can pick up from these first two verses here nothing is said about Paul and Silas having to canvas the area or to hunt for the synagogue they knew exactly where it was and they knew right where to go. Somebody had pointed them there. Fifth thing, it may be implied that they were sent out on a Friday night. You know, have you ever tried to figure out the timing of things or do you sort of just sort of read through the text and don't try to figure out when things took place? I like to figure out when things took place. 
because apparently they arrived on a Saturday morning when there was a synagogue worship service going on. They were only in Berea for three Sabbath days uh, in, in Thessalonica before, for three Sabbath days before the riot occurred, so they would have been spirited secretly out of Thessalonica before the fourth Saturday. The text says they were only there for three Saturdays. The fifth thing that we learn from the text is the term sent away. Now, there are three or four different words for to send in the New Testament. The mo most common one is apostello, from which we get the word apostle. But that's not the term that's used here. This word, sent away, implies that this little fledgling church in Thessalonica had made physical provision for Paul and Silas on their journey. Things like food and money and clothing and other necessities. Ekpempo. That means to dispatch on an errand. It emphasizes the point of departure. It's not apostello, to send out as at the other churches where the apostles were sent on their missionary journeys. Apostello implies an orderly departure. Ekpempo emphasizes the need for haste. It also, as you look up that word and track it through the New Testament, emphasizes and includes the concept of bestowing, of providing for needs. You know, God inspired the scripture in the original languages of Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. And God chose specific words because he is emphasizing things that are going on in the text. And so we find the word ekpempo here used for us. Then we get down to the word that is very fascinating to us. It says these were more noble. That is, the people at Berea were more noble. Now, you have heard this word in English, or you've heard a word so close to it you can hardly tell the difference. Eugenes, or eugenes. It means well-born. We get our word eugenics from this. One who is well-born, more noble means well-born. You, good, and genes, to be born. One who is high in rank, one who is generous, one who is a nobleman. But you know, as we look at the text here, we have no indication. In fact, no indication at all. That's just a reference to their social status. Because the text describes for us and defines for us what it means in this context. It's a reference to the way that God saw them. Because not many with this kind of social status are among the elect. And Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And you know it's going to be interesting because there is going to be a play between the churches of Macedonia, of which Berea was one, and the church at Corinth. We'll see that, the Lord willing, at the end of this message if I get through on time. <laughs> These were more noble than those at Thessalonica. But... It's not a reference to those who are high in rank, generous, or noblemen. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We read it in the morning worship a couple of weeks ago. Starting in verse 21, it says, For after that the preach in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block. Under the Greeks foolishness. Come on you got to give me a break. A stumbling block to the Jews, that's not how they viewed their Messiah. The Greeks, that's nuts. What kind of a hero is that that gets crucified? But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now here's our verse, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, and here is our word, eugenes. Not many noble, not many eugenes are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound those things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, as we look at what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and compare it where the same word is used over in Acts chapter 17, we know that it's not merely a description of their genetic heritage because we are told specifically in the text why they were more noble. Verse 11 tells us that. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that, or for this reason, or because they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. The first key in that little phrase that I just read there was they received the word. 
they received the word. You know, that's the bottom line. That's the opening door. That's the one thing that gets you across the threshold. They received the word. Why is that so? Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You can believe all kinds of things, but it doesn't get you across the threshold. You can study the religions of the world, that doesn't get you across the threshold. You can study moral philosophy, that doesn't get you across the threshold. You can study all the different kinds of good works organizations that have ever existed and try to put it all into one ball, that doesn't get you across the threshold. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They received the word. That's what got them across the threshold. Paul, speaking of the word, writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 5, he says, This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. You're not saved until you hear the word of God and believe it. You don't receive the Spirit until you hear the word of God and believe it. Verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The people of Thessalonica were more noble, excuse me, at Berea were more noble than those at Thessalonica, because they received the word. The second key we find in the phrase, readiness of mind. Very interesting terms that are used here. Readiness of mind means a willingness of mind. It's not like some people's mind, which are like concrete, you know, all mixed up and thoroughly set. But these are people who were forward in spirit. They were people who wanted to learn. They weren't merely people who showed up at church because that's what they had always done, and they couldn't think of anything better to do on Sunday morning. They didn't want to listen to a charismatic preacher on the, on the television. And, you know, they had already gotten up and eaten breakfast, so they figured they might as well come to church. That was not this kind of people. They wanted to learn. They were eager. This word, if you'll look this up in Strong's, you'll see the word alacrity. That means nimble speed. When you pick up your Bible, do you do it with nimble speed? You're rushing around the house because, man, you've got to get to your Bible study. No, not because you're late to church. It's your personal Bible study. You have a nimble speed as you grab the Bible as you eagerly thirst over the Word of God. Thy word was unto me more than my necessary food. You'd rather have the scripture before you eat breakfast because you're so hungry in your spirit. That's what we find here. That's the word for readiness of mind. That was the same spirit in which the churches of Macedonia gave financial support. Did you know that your eagerness for scripture makes you eager to give? That's what happened. Remember I said a few minutes ago that we're going to look back at the relationship between Corinth and these other Macedonian churches that are listed for us here? In fact, the Apostle Paul used these Macedonian churches, including Berea, as an example to the Corinthian church. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit that we remind you of, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, where's Paul? This is his Macedonian missionary journey, right? We're traveling through Macedonia with the Apostle Paul. And he's gone to the various places that we have talked about already, and now he's in Berea. So he said, I want to remind you about the churches in Macedonia. Berea is one of them. How that, in a great trial of affliction, did we see some trouble for the church at Thessalonica? Was there a trial of affliction going on at Thessalonica? Where they ran the Apostle Paul out of town? Where Jason and the others who got caught had to pay a fine because they had housed Paul? Was a problem going on? Yes. How about in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy? The people at Berea sound like they're excited. I think so. Even the people at Thessalonica where they were having grief were excited the way they joined and bonded together within just three weeks period of time. But look at the next phrase, and their deep poverty. Remember we talked about the word noble? 
The world has one view of what is noble. In the eyes of God, there is another view of what is noble. These were not the rich people when we get to Berea. They weren't rich people at Thessalonica. We see some who were. But it says, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That is their generosity. They were not giving out of their surplus. They were giving out of what they needed for their own basic daily living. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You see, they understood the principle that Paul speaks to the Philippians. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so they didn't spare the Apostle Paul is going to give another illustration to that out of the Old Testament in just a minute here in our text that I'm reading in 2 Corinthians. He'll give another illustration of it so that we will understand that principle that no matter how much we give based on spirit-led motivation, not based on carnal manipulation. There are some preachers out there who use carnal manipulation. But based on spirit-led giving that they know that God will always supply their need. Let me go on. Praying us, begging us with much entreaty that we'd receive the gift. They'd taken an offering and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You see, if you've already given yourself to Christ and really meant it, that means that everything that you have belongs to him anyway. All you are is a steward. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would finish in you the same grace also. Churches of Macedonia did it. Now let's talk about you guys at Corinth. Churches of Macedonia were poor. They were, they were being oppressed. They were having a difficult time. But they were filled with joy. And it moved them to give. That's the group of churches that searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Not like at Corinth, where they're living in all kinds of horrible immorality and suing each other at courts of law and doing all the horrendous things that you read in 1 Corinthians. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, remember they had lots of gifts at Corinth, and in all diligence and your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also, which is the grace of giving. I speak not by commandment. Notice I'm not telling you guys you got to do it because the law said so. Hey, I want to check your bank account. Did you actually give 10% last year? Was it on the gross or was it on the net? No, Paul says, I'm not doing that. But by occasion of the forwardness of others, that is the churches of Macedonia, and to pr prove the sincerity of your love. Did you know? You've heard me say this before. But the people you love, those are the people to whom you give most gladly. The ones that you love are the ones that are the greatest beneficiaries of your generosity. We know this in the context of families. Parents who give everything, even the shirt off their back, so their kids will have food and clothing, be able to go to school, be able to do this and that and the other thing, while the parents just struggle along. The kids oftentimes just take it for granted, like, well, you know, they're my parents, they're supposed to do this. <laughs> yes, but the reason of supposed to do it is not the reason the parents do it. It's because of love. That's why they do it for their children. Sometimes parents withhold things from children who ought to be doing it for themselves because they're trying to teach accountability and responsibility to the children. But in general, we give to the people that we love most. We give to God because our love for him should be greater than any other love. We should love the Lord Jesus Christ more than anyone else. Father, mother, brother, sister, parent, child. Christ should come first. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, that is, the churches of Macedonia, and to prove the sincerity of your love. You can talk it, do you walk it? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. In other words, you guys have taken a long time getting around to doing this. 
You've dragged your feet for a year. Let's have a show of hands. How many of you have ever dragged your feet on doing something that you really didn't want to do? Have you ever dragged your feet? Oh, come on. All of you have dragged your feet. <laughs> you can raise your hand. It's not a charismatic thing. We're all waving our hands and swinging back and forth and all that kind of stuff. We've all dragged our feet, haven't we? The stuff that we really aren't interested in doing, we really wish we didn't have to do it. We know we're supposed to do it. We know we have an obligation that, but we really don't want. The church at Corinth was a foot dragger. They knew they were supposed to take up an offering. They knew it and they had promised to do it, but they hadn't gotten around to it. Herein is my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it. And then we have our phrase. Very similar to what we saw over there in Acts. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. He's just given them the illustration of a church that had nothing. He said that church there in Macedonia, that group of churches, the churches of Macedonia, including Berea and Thessalonica and the others where Paul has stopped, they've already done it. You promised to do it a year ago. You seemed eager about it. You had a ready mind. Remember, that was what said is about the church at Berea. But the church at Berea had one distinction. They not only had a ready mind, they did. They not only got excited about it, but they didn't put it on the back burner. The church at Corinth put it on the back burner. And then he gives the illustration. <clears throat> it's accepted according to that a man hath, not according to that he hath not. You don't have to go out and borrow money. Some churches tell you, <clears throat> look, we're in a building campaign or we're in this kind of a campaign and we need money, so go out and borrow money and then give the money to the church and then the bank will make you pay it back because if we have to wait for you to put this in piece at a time, we'll never get to our goal. So we want to reach our goal now. So you guys, each of you go out to the bank, take out a big $10,000 loan, put it on your credit card or whatever you do, you know, go to the banker and talk to him and then you pay it off month at a time, but we get the money now, we go ahead with our projects now. No. It says, it's accepted according to the man hath and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened. And then he gives the illustration. But by an equality, that now at this time that your abundance may supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality, as it is written, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. Do you recognize that last verse? Do you know what he's talking about? That's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. You remember, as they were walking through the wilderness, God sent manna to the children of Israel. And the first time that there was a gathering of the manna, some people went out there and they thought, man, this is never going to happen again. They weren't aware of what was going to go on for the next 40 years. This is never going to happen again. Man, we're going to hoard this stuff. And some of them got huge piles of manna. And you know what? When they tried to keep it overnight, what happened to it? It rotted, it stank, and it grew worms. Because God said, I'm going to provide your needs on a day-by-day -day basis. Rather interesting because here they search the scriptures daily. God meets our needs daily, not only in the temporal realm, but in the spiritual realm too. And you need it every day. God made sure that everyone had what was necessary. He that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. Same thing that Paul had said to the Philippians, also one of the churches of Macedonia. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said, I'm not trying to put the burden on you guys and let everybody else off the hook. They gave out of their deep poverty. They gave generously out of their deep poverty. You guys at Corinth, Corinth was a little richer city. A lot more available there in Corinth. 
You guys promised to do it, and you haven't taken the first step forward. You're foot draggers. You see, Paul is dealing with real people in real churches, in a real area, and showing them how they relate one to another. They're taking an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem who are in even worse distress. The mother church, the one that had set out the missionaries, the one who now was having a difficulty surviving. They had an obligation. But it wasn't merely an obligation. It should have been a motivation of love. That's what Paul is emphasizing in the text. Your mind has to start off in the right position for spiritual growth and relationship to God because it is only as you get your heart and mind right with God that it will motivate your actions to do what Paul is talking about here and what we see the Berean church doing. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What did the churches of Macedonia do? They first gave of themselves, and then unto us by the will of God. That's what Paul is referencing here in Romans 12.1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. They gave of themselves unto God. It's your reasonable service. And then what's the second thing? It's what he mentions that happened in the church at Berea and the churches of Macedonia as he uses them to contrast what's going on at, Corinthian, at Corinth. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There was a readiness of mind at Berea. There was a willingness of mind. Their minds were transformed by the scripture. God doesn't use philosophy to transform your mind. He uses the word of God that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Ha! That is, give outward visible evidence. Was there outward visible evidence that showed up as a result of the transforming of the mind after these people had presented their bodies as living sacrifice? Was there outward visible evidence in the church at Berea and then later in all the churches of Macedonia as Paul contrasts them with Corinth? They're learning this from Berea. Three verses it gives them. But as you begin to search the scriptures and find those same words used in different places and begin to compare what's happening in the different churches, you see that those who focused on the word of God had transformed actions, not merely transformed minds. That you may prove, visibly demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Third key. We've looked at two keys so far. Now the third key is the word searched. They searched the scriptures, it says. Searched. Rather interesting word here, because there are a lot of different words for search. This is the word anacrino, to investigate thoroughly. It comes from a compound of two different words. The word crino is the word to judge. When you look at judgment and judging all the way through scripture, through the New Testament, you find this word krino showing up to judge. And then ana, which is the prefix. Whenever it's used as a prefix, it indicates, indicates three things. It indicates repetition. It indicates intensity. And it indicates fervor, hot burning zeal. When you find it attached as a prefix to another word, it indicates repetition, intensity, and zealous fervor. It says they searched, they anacrinoed. They judged repetitively, intensely, with fervor what Paul was saying. And they compared it with the law books, if you will. A lawyer who wants to, to win his case is going to study hard whatever statutory law says and compare it with what the Constitution says and compare it with perhaps other jurisdictions because he wants to make the very best possible presentation in court and the judge is going to do the same thing. These people were examining Paul's arguments. This was not a lackadaisical perusal of the daily Bible reading for five minutes while eating breakfast. And yet that's the way most of us study the scripture searched on a crino to investigate thoroughly 
repetition, intensity, fervor. The fourth key that we find in our passage and our time is running out here. The fourth key is they searched the scriptures. They didn't search the commentaries. They didn't search through the confession. They didn't dig through the catechism. They didn't dig through the form of government. They searched the scriptures. Now those things may be helpful along the way, but that's not where you start. Those things may confirm what you study, but that's not where you start. They have the Old Testament. They didn't even have the New Testament. They searched the scriptures. Because you see, the answer is not in commentaries. The answer is not in books on religion. The answer is not in books on ethical philosophy. The answer is not in comparative religious studies. The touchstone is scripture. The answer is not merely believing what this preacher says because that's the easiest thing to do. The answer is not rejecting what this preacher says because that's easier to do than really studying to see if whether or not what he says is true. I won't ask for a show of hands on this, but you'll know in your own heart. Over the last year, you have probably heard me say some things that you were surprised at. And you wondered, I wonder if that's really true. Or over the last year, you have probably heard me say some things that you thought, I don't agree with that. You crossed your arms and arched your back, sat back there and squinted your eyes at me. Now, the question is this. When either of those two events took place, I thought, oh, that's cool. I really like that. Or, I sure don't like that. Did you, and you should have, go home and say, I'm going to check him out? That's an important question. I'm going to check him out. I'm not just going to dismiss it. I'm not just going to accept it. But it's something I hadn't heard before. I'm going to examine the scriptures to see whether or not he said what he said is true. Now remember something, folks. You've got tools that those people didn't have. You've got Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. You've got Vines. You've got all kinds of other Greek and Hebrew helps where you can look up where a particular word, for example, like I've talked about different Greek words tonight, where those words occur, you can look them up for yourself. You can read them in your own Bibles. You've got copies of the Bibles. Think about the days when everything was handwritten. And these people were searching the scriptures daily. And they would have to say, now, man, I heard something. Was it back when the cantor was reading out of Isaiah? Or And then they would have to go and find an Isaiah scroll, and they'd have to find out whether or not what Paul said was true by hunting through a scroll. They didn't have computer access where you could look the word up where you can compare it in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Now back to the question. In the last year, on something that y'all was really cool, but you, it was new, you hadn't heard it before, or something you thought, I really don't agree with the pastor on that, did you search the scripture until you found out whether I was right or wrong? Did you do it even once over this past year? You should have. They checked out Paul. If they checked out Paul, you should check this preacher out too to make sure you're not getting heresy, that you're not getting some kind of alien waves that's swooping down on you from some sort of a weirdo source that I got out of the Bhagavad Gita or the Rig Veda or some Hindu manuscript somewhere. They searched the scriptures. That's our fourth key. The fifth key is daily. As you look back over the past month, are there any days that you actually missed the study of Scripture? I'm not talking about your five minutes of reading in the morning to pat yourself on the back and say you've been a good little boy for the day. Can you think of even one day where you missed the study, the searching, the anacrinoing, the intense, repetitive fervor of judging this versus this versus this versus this. Can you think of even one day when you didn't do that? I think we all can. 
The fifth key is daily. Nothing should stand in the way of your time with God in the Word. The sixth and final is the comparison of Paul's teaching with Scripture. They checked him out, whether these things were so. The greatest Bible teacher who ever lived, other than our Lord Jesus Christ, was put under the magnifying glass to see if it complied with the Scripture. That's why they were called more noble than those at Thessalonica. I pray that God will call us more noble in that we search the Scripture daily whether these things are so. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It is our final touchstone. It is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Not all the writings of men, even though they may be great, even though they may be concise, even though they've been put into very organized form and used for centuries, it is the word of God that is our final authority. Father, help us to be men and women of the book. Help us, as was said of the Bereans, to be more noble than those of Thessalonica in that we search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is number 511, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. Let's